Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I am uh, Mukhtar Raban, the coordinator of the Humanizing Pedagogy Practices and Research niche at Nelson Mandela University. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome all to our second webinar in the Exploring a Humanizing Pedagogy series. We are particularly excited today to welcome and host a world-renowned scholar, Professor Maria Salazar from the United States. As we know, the humanizing pedagogy is integral to our philosophy, approaches, and practices at Nelson Mandela University. I'm quite positive that any colleague at our university who has explored the humanizing pedagogy was introduced to and rely upon Professor Salazar's works quite extensively, cited in nearly every single humanizing pedagogy related document initiative or project at our university. As such, it is truly an honor to host Prof Salazar today. We are also welcoming our amazing Dr. Jackie Lick, the acting deputy dean for the Faculty of Humanities and a senior lecturer in the Department of Applied Language Studies. Dr. Lick will also honor us with a response to Prof Salazar's presentation. I welcome everyone joining us on Zoom, all our webinar participants, and those watching the stream on Facebook, on behalf of the HPPRN and the Learning and Teaching Collab, a hearty welcome. The Deputy Vice Chancellor for Learning and Teaching at Nelson Mandela University, Professor Cheryl Foxcroft, would have loved to attend in real time, but a pressing matter arose and she has sent us a recorded welcome, which I will play shortly. It is my pleasant privilege to welcome you to the webinar series on the humanizing pedagogy. As you might know, a humanizing pedagogical approach is core to the way that we approach the facilitation of learning and teaching at Nelson Mandela University. We are particularly privileged this afternoon to have Professor Salazar with us a renowned expert in the field. Professor Salazar, when I first got introduced to humanizing pedagogy, yours was the first article that I read. So we really are privileged to have you join us for this particular webinar to make a presentation. We look forward to what you are going to share. To all the colleagues who are joining, I hope that you feel very welcome. Thank you, Prof Foxcroft. Before I formally introduce our speaker, just a few house rules. Uh, the mics have been muted for the duration of the presentation and response. Please feel free to post questions and comments in the chat while the presenter and respondent are speaking. There will be a Q&A session towards the end of the webinar and all questions will be posed then. At that stage, you may also raise your hand or request the mic in the chat and I'll send you a request to unmute. You may also send your questions directly to me by selecting my name from the drop down. We are looking forward to an engaging session this afternoon, while it's this morning in the States. Uh, colleagues, it is with immense honor and pleasure that I welcome Professor Maria Salazar. Dr. Maria Salazar is a professor of teaching and learning sciences in the Mortgage College of Education at the University of Denver in the United States. Professor Salazar has authored 35 publications and delivered 125 scholarly national and international presentations on a humanizing pedagogy, equitable teaching and teacher evaluation and college access and success. She's the author of Teacher Evaluation as Culture, a Framework for Equitable and Excellent Teaching. She is also the lead author on a briefing to the United States Congress related to the state of the Latinx community in the States. In 2018, she was the recipient of the American Educational Research Association Award for Innovations in Research on Equity and Social Justice in Teacher Education. She served on the board of directors of the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation. And she is currently a member of the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation Equity and Diversity Committee. She's also currently an associate editor for the Journal of Teacher Education. She's proud of her accomplishments as a first generation college student and Mexican immigrant. Professor Salazar, it is our utmost honor to host you at Nelson Mandela University, and we are thrilled and deeply grateful 
that you are able to present to us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, muchas gracias. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and the comments as well. Um, buenos dias from the United States, from Denver, Colorado, and buenas tardes um, where you are now. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here and I will just jump in and get started. You heard a little bit about uh, my accomplishments, but one thing I'm very proud of is that I'm a full professor and that only well, I'm not proud of this fact, but less than 1% of all professors in the United States are of Latina descent. Um, that's a difficult uh, statistic, but it also shows you how challenging it is for us to get to the top rank of a professor in the United States as well. The reason I'm so proud of that is because I am a first generation college student. And so that's something that um, it's been a long journey, right? A long journey toward humanization. And that's what you're going to hear from me today is my journey toward humanization and how this journey has helped me to develop the concept of Paulo Freire's of a humanizing pedagogy. And I wanna start by sharing a few of my testimonios, testimonies or stories, because they will help you understand how I conceptualize a humanizing pedagogy and why. Maya Angelou says that there's no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. Um, it is agonizing to keep our stories inside, but I find that it's also agonizing to share them um, because many of us have had some challenging experiences in life. And so um, either way, it's agonizing whether you keep them in or let them go. And I find it agonizing to share my stories. A few stories I want to share with you today, but the first is titled The Rosebud in the Concrete. Did you hear about the rose that grew from concrete? Proving nature's laws wrong, it learned to walk without having feet. Funny it seems, but by keeping its dreams, it learned to breathe fresh air. Long live the rose that grew from concrete when no one else ever cared. This comes from the poetry of a famous American poet, philosopher, composer, rock and roll hall of fame artist and rapper by the name of Tupac Amaru Shakur. I am a rose that grew from concrete. I'm going to share with you a little bit about that concrete in a minute, the harshness and the beauty of the concrete. Uh, first, I wanna show you some pictures of myself and my family as a child. In the top left corner, you see my grandmother and grandfather, Cristobal and Paula Salazar. My grandfather was white, blonde, um, and blue-eyed, and my grandmother was indigenous. We don't know what tribe my grandmother came from in Mexico. I asked my father recently, and he said that they never spoke of it. Um, on the right side, you will see my mother and father, Patrocinio and Imelda. They are both Mexican immigrants. My father has a third grade education, from Mexico and my mother has a sixth grade education and they're holding me looking very stylish there in the little apron. In the middle you see my siblings, all but one of my siblings is there, my youngest brother. Um, there you will see my two brothers who passed away and you'll hear a little bit about their story as well today and my sisters as them are there as well. Imelda, Susana, Rocio and I'm in the green again looking stylish. On the bottom, you see me from kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and third grade, so primary education. Notice how I assimilate across. Notice how different my look is in the last picture on the right. right? And you'll hear a little bit about that assimilation that happened in my experience in public schools in the United States. I wanna tell you a little bit about the harshness of the concrete. Not a lot because we don't have a lot of time, but. I, one thing I want to talk about is being shackled with the label of being limited English proficient. In the United States, there's our federal designations when students are learning English as a second language, and LEP, limited English proficient, is one of those. When I first heard this term, I thought it was a disease, but it's actually a label that I was shackled with that would follow me throughout my education and lead to deficit perspectives of who I was and what I could do. The other thing I wanna to talk to you about is my family, how challenging our experience was. Um, my parents struggled economically because they were immigrants from Mexico and they had um, access to very few good jobs, also because of their level of education, not speaking English. 
Um, people often thought, teachers often taught my parents, thought my parents weren't involved because they never went to school. They weren't part of the process of schooling as other parents are. But the most impactful thing that happened in my family was tra a very traumatic event. When I was six years old and my little brother was five years old, we were in Mexico, we were visiting for the summer and we we're playing hide and go seek. And we couldn't find my little brother, Ricardo. And we looked for him for, I felt like we looked for him for hours, but it must not have been hours um, until my father brought his lifeless body out of the water well. But it appeared that my little brother had went to hide in the water well. Um, what I did not know actually until recently was that he was still living when my father took his body out of the well. But I remember them placing my little brother's body in my mother's arms. And I remember the wails of my mother, like La Llorona, a Mexican legend of the crying woman, and her cries were inhumane. And I remember them putting me in the car with him, his lifeless body, and taking him to the doctor, but he had already passed away. I remember playing around his casket and thinking that he would wake up soon and not understanding what was happening. And my parents telling us that he's, he was sleeping. And then I remember my mother when we got home to Denver calling the school and saying, Ricardo won't be going to school because he died. And I still didn't understand the concept of death, probably until I was about 10 years old. And then I blamed myself like everyone in our family. So because of this trauma, then my parents didn't know how to deal with this trauma. And there was domestic violence in my home between my mother and my father and my father and my oldest brother. Um, we're not sure if someone told my oldest brother that it was his fault, but he always felt like it was. And so he spiraled from there and became involved in drugs and alcohol and crime. Eventually he would commit a crime and flee to Mexico and he would start on a lifelong struggle with alcoholism. Um, recently, about three years ago, my brother passed away from complications due to alcoholism, my brother Javier. And I remember clearly one night taking care of him when he was in a drunken stupor, it was New Year's Eve. And I remember him waking and having this crazed and terrified look on his face. And he was saying, where's my brother? Where's my brother? I can't find my brother. And so as we buried my older brother, Javier, next to my youngest brother, Ricardo, I remember the tears streaming down my face and sobbing and thinking, he found my brother, he found my brother. So that trauma would impact me. That was part of the harshness of the concrete that I grew up in. The other part of the harshness was our schooling and our community. I grew up in a community in Denver that was very poor and impoverished with high crime rates a lack of resources. Um, I also went to schools that were dropout factories. They intentionally pushed us out. They were designed to push us out. And our dropout rate at the high school level was phenomenal. I would say about 80% dropout rate. So we had little support, we were segregated and our teachers suffered from the pobrecito syndrome. Pobrecito means poor little one in Spanish. And they lowered the bar so that we could just step over it. Those poor little ones, they'll be lucky to graduate from high school. There was no thought of us ever going to college. And so they saw us as at risk. The Colorado Department of Education has a number of uh, indicators for being at risk. I met two of these indicators where my brother met all but two. And so many of our teachers viewed us as at risk, those poor little ones. But what they didn't see was the beauty of the concrete. They didn't see our amazing resources and gifts being bicultural and bilingual. They didn't see how amazing my family was, how much they, despite all our challenges, how much they sacrificed their language, their culture, their family to bring their children to the United States for a different opportunity. The great extended family I had, even fictive kin. We had people we called family who were of no blood relation and our family persevered and we were resilient. It was the source of our strength, right? This concrete became a source of our strength. I had a few teachers who believed in me and that helped me move, but it was my community that was resourceful, innovative, hopeful, and resilient that helped me continue to move forward. And so many of our teachers did not see us compromesa with promise. They only saw what we were lacking 
a can't do approach versus a can do approach. All of these wonderful, amazing affirmations and gifts that we had, like being language brokers and cultural brokers, agents of change, survivors. They did not see all the positives of the concrete. This is illustrated in a poem that I published in the Bilingual Research Journal. Typically the Bilingual Research Journal is a, it's a high impact journal with um, only academic resources that are publications. However, my advisor at the time, Maria Franquis, Dr. Maria Franquis was the editor of the journal and she encouraged me to go beyond the boundaries of academic writing. And this was the first poem that I published. So the master narrative, no books, no resources, no support, no language, no work. Again, this poem really lays out how we can't do, don't have our limited, disadvantaged, illiterate. But our counter narrative is that we are boundary spanders, bilingual, bicultural, biliterate. Our, our source of literacy in our home were from our culture. And that is something that our teachers could not see, that source of literacy. Instead, we were fenced in the margins, our literary genius hidden, invisible, silenced and erased. And so this is that contrast of an asset orientation versus a deficit orientation and how educators approached us often from the deficit perspective. They saw the concrete, they saw the harshness of the concrete, but they did not see the beauty. Today, I know that the concrete is a source of strength for me. It resides inside of me. I don't want to leave the concrete behind. It's who I am. And this aligns with the work again of our famous American poet, philosopher, composer, and rapper, Tupac Amaru Shakur. You see, you wouldn't ask why the rose that grew from concrete had damaged petals. On the contrary, we would all celebrate its tenacity. We would all love its will to reach the sun. Well, we are the roses, this is the concrete, and these are my damaged petals. And so I often entreat educators to celebrate our will to reach the sun because the concrete is that source of resiliency for us. Through this struggle in my early years, I found myself, and this is something I call I power, individual and community strengths and challenges that are essential part of one's humanity. There you see a painting by Frida Kahlo, a famous Mexican artist. You see her with one foot on either side of the US-Mexico border. And you see the beauty and the harshness of the concrete. And that is how I found myself um, as a person with multiple identities and intersectional identities that is surrounded by the beauty of the harshness of the concrete of the US and Mexico. But yet I always belong felt like neither side wanted me and I was a citizen from nowhere. And so I had to find that internal drive and find myself in that process. The next story I want to share with you is my first grade teacher stole my humanity. When I told my teenage daughter this title, she said, wow, mom, you're so dramatic. And I said, yes, that's what I was going for. There you see a picture of me in kindergarten on the left and then in first grade on the right. When I entered kindergarten, Mr. Lopez told me I was so smart I could learn in two languages. It was a bilingual classroom. And I walked in proudly with my mochila, with my backpack, and it had all my treasures, my language, my culture, my family, my history, my heritage. And Mr. Lopez let me and encouraged me to bring that into the classroom and he built on it, he added to it. But then in first grade, it was very different. I was mainstreamed into an English only classroom with Miss Kowalski and my experience was agonizing. I write about this experience in the article, A Humanizing Pedagogy in the Review of Research and Education. I abandoned my mochila, my backpack, my treasures at the classroom door my first grade teacher would give me a new one, one that had more value. It had the English language, the US culture and US ways of knowing. And I repelled everything that was native to me and I craved whiteness. Um, in the third grade, I wanted to be white and I, I believed that if I got into the top reading group, I would become white. And when I got into the top reading group and my skin didn't change, 
I was overwhelmed that I would have to live in my dark skin forever. La morena, that word means dark skin, the dark skinned girl. And so this followed me throughout my K-12 education, all the way through high school. I'm wanting to leave who I was behind, resisting speaking Spanish where my father would not speak to me unless I spoke Spanish to him. And just wanting to be a different person, right? wanting to be someone who had value and someone who was white. It was through this experience in my uh, K-12 education as well that I found the culture of power as Lisa Delpit calls it. Dispositions, knowledge and skills that I needed to successfully navigate the US culture and systems. And every nation has this as well, their own culture of power. And often these are aligned with Western ways and white ways of knowing and seeing the world. This is a, an artwork by Frida Kahlo. I found my feet. So I had found myself and now I felt I found my feet and I was able to leave my community to go to college. But then I had to reclaim my treasures. I wanted my treasures back. I wanted my mochila back, my backpack. This is uh, artwork by Diego Rivera, also a Mexican artist. And you see in the middle, an indigenous woman surrounded by all of her treasures. And I wanted those treasures back. And so it was through my experience in higher education that I learned to rise um, by Maya Angelou's poem uh, captures those sentiments. And I'll just read the bottom. Out of the hit huts of history shame, I rise up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise, bringing the gifts my ancestors gave, I rise, I rise, I rise. But this rise was not because of my university professors. I waited for them to give me back my treasures. I thought they would be different than my teachers in my K-12 education, but they didn't. They upheld the Western canon and they used it like a weapon of mass destruction to keep America great or keep America white. And so again, I was denied my humanity. Again, my professor stole my humanity and I had to retake my heritage, my language, my culture on my own. I started to devour anything related to my cultural heritage, my Mexican heritage and indigenous heritage. And I learned about the greatness of our people. And today I teach my children that we can't help but be great because we have greatness in our blood. We are, our ancestors are the Aztecs, the Incas, the Mayans. We are healers, engineers. We are philosophers, we are astronomers and we are so much more and we can't help but be great. And so here, um, books saved my sanity, knowledge opened the locked places in me and taught me first how to survive and how to soar. And those books were related to my own culture and that's how I found my wings. So I didn't want those feet anymore to leave my community because I had wings and my wings were going to take me back to my community and connect me back to those, the power of my culture, the cultural resources that impact students' ways of knowing and their full development as human beings. So you're hearing now that I needed all of these things to be successful. I needed myself, I needed my feet, and I needed my wings. I needed eye power, the culture of power and the power of culture but I did not find my true power until I found my voice. Um, this is something that I found in my doctoral program when I found Dr. Maria Franquis, my advisor, and she introduced me to the work of Paulo Freire, who is the creator of the humanizing pedagogy. Um, and so through finding a pedagogy of the oppressed, I was finally able to put words to my experience of dehumanization and my journey to humanization. And this, these are the words of Gloria Andalzúa, who is a borderland scholar in the United States of America. I will have my voice, Indian, Spanish, white. I will have my serpent's tongue, my woman's voice, my sexual voice, my poet's voice. I will overcome the tradition of silence. And so today I use my voice as a shield, a tool and a weapon for my community 
and communities of color, communities at the margins, in order to bring our testimonios or our stories um, to the forefront and to the center. It was here that I, because I found my voice that I found the power of consciousness, critical consciousness. This is critical reflection and action towards social justice for self, family, and community. And this is my life's work today, social justice for myself, my children, my family, and my community. And so this is how my journey toward humanization led me to this concept of a humanizing pedagogy. Today, this is how I conceptualize a humanizing pedagogy with four pillars. I'm currently in the process of updating that article on a humanizing pedagogy I published in 2013 in another review of education and a review of humanizing pedagogy. And this will be also the blueprint for my book on a humanizing pedagogy. And so the four pillars, the four things I needed to get where I am today were myself, my feet, my wings, and my voice. I needed eye power, the strengths that come from my individual sense and my community, those strengths and challenges, the culture of power, which helped me to succeed in the US society, but I needed the power of my culture to be successful. I had to have it. And ultimately I needed the power of consciousness so that I could not only create change for myself, but for others in, in my community and communities that I feel are at the margins. And this is what led me to the concept of a mutual humanization that Paulo Freire talks about. As I humanize myself and attempt to humanize my children and my family, then I also attempt to humanize with alongside communities at the margins, that concept of a mutual humanization. And this is what led me to my, uh, how I see a humanizing pedagogy in my practice and how I enact it. So the theory of a humanizing pedagogy must be put on the ground and must be put on the pra in practice for it to have value. Again, Paulo Freire talked about reflection and action as praxis. And today I have, uh, tengo tres ejemplos, I have three examples of this in my own practice. One example is my latest project, the One Tribe Family Freedom School here in Denver, and we are looking to take it national as well, and maybe even international. So freedom schools arose in the 1960s in the United States when uh, Black children were being forced from their schools and eventually deseg into desegregated schools. And so these schools allowed them to have an opportunity to engage academically, but also to engage in racial and social justice and activism. And so the Freedom School includes children from ages three all the way to 18 and their families. And we've also included community members here who don't have children in the school. This is a supplementary education. It happens two Saturdays a month. And right now it's virtual because of COVID as well. So this is something that we're so proud of. And this is the team that I work with on the right side. We're so proud of this because we want to be able to give children a humanizing pedagogy starting at age three and even younger when we go prenatal and when we go into infancy as well, which we hope to build. And so imagine how powerful our children will be when they get to high school and college and they're able to have this critical consciousness and they have eye power and the culture of power and the power of culture and the power of consciousness. Uh, the power that exists in our communities is phenomenal. The One Tribe Freedom School, Family Freedom School is open to all, but we focus on black, brown and indigenous communities. And when I say brown, I mean mestizo, people who are of Spanish and indigenous descent in the Americas. Another example of my work is in teacher evaluation. This is my book, Teacher Evaluation as Cultural Practice. Here, I present a framework for equitable and excellent teaching. Here, I challenge teacher evaluation as white supremacist. There is no neutrality and objectivity in a teacher evaluation tool as many tools purport, including one tool that is widely used nationally and even internationally named the Danielson framework. I state that this framework is white supremacist and that by placing objectivity and neutrality at the center, in fact, what they're doing is placing whiteness at the center. And I propose another framework 
that is focused on equity and excellence that puts the resources of communities of color at the center of teacher evaluation, not at the margins. Uh, one of my favorite chapters in this book, however, is the last chapter around interrogating teacher evaluation and not being boxed in, not using the master's tools to dismantle the master's house and looking outside of traditional forms of teacher evaluation, like community-based teacher evaluation as well. Um, which is a concept that I'm currently developing with one of my doctoral students who's on this, um, who's on this Zoom, uh, uh, Adrian Blumenthal. So this is another example of a humanizing pedagogy and how we can put a humanizing pedagogy on the ground. The humanizing pedagogy is infused throughout the framework for equitable and excellent teaching. I argue that unless we put a humanizing pedagogy into teacher evaluation, there's no accountability and there's no roadmap and teachers enact it only out of the goodness of their heart. And so we have to create a framework and a roadmap um, toward this humanizing pedagogy in teacher evaluation. The last thing I want to share with you is just an example of how I embed a humanizing pedagogy into the higher education classroom. When I teach in the teacher education program or when I teach masters and doctoral students in our curriculum and instruction program, these are some of the strategies that I use to enact a humanizing pedagogy into my teaching. First, I connect with students. I do this in a myriad of ways, but now that we're on Zoom and we're online in our teaching, it's actually been, I've had to work a little bit harder to connect with students, but I do things like a show and share at the beginning of class where students introduce us to family members, pets, uh, share, a, um, share a hobby with us. And this is a way that we connect with each other and I build on their lives that I'm seeing in the Zoom or I introduce them to my children. And so I share also with them my own home and my own family as well. I've also shared my humanity with them. I always share my stories and experiences with them. And this then encourages them to share their stories and experiences with me. And we engage in this sense of mutual humanization. I give them choice always in assessments and that is a humanizing assessment practice um, because choice allows them to work from what they value and their ways of knowing. The other thing I do with my assessment practices is I use multiple means of assessment. And when I give feedback, I always use their first name, always, always, always to connect. I always start with the positive and then I start with the room for growth. And that is strategic and humanizing as well. I integrate content that reflects who they are, uh, social media, multimedia, readings. I set high standards. There's no pobrecito or poor little one. Um, syndrome in my classroom, right? There's no pobrecito approach. I have very high standards and I provide support for my students as well. And I apologize, I'm having some technical issues on my end. Um, so just one other thing as I continue here, uh, that was actually very much the end, but as I continue to get this presentation back, I believe, I can share my screen again, sorry. There it is. So just the one last thing, engage with the community, how important it is to engage communities, bringing community members in, but also taking higher education students out of the classroom. For example, I've taken my students to a local high school to engage with a powerful teacher named William Anderson, who is actually teaching his high school students a pedagogy of the oppressed. And my graduate students were able to interact with his high school students around the pedagogy of the oppressed and their learning. And they watched him do a culture circle with his students as well. So again, engaging community is important. As I end my comments, I never leave with a closing, but always with an opening. Um, the opening here is your own journey toward humanization. And so things to consider through your own journey through humanization, I would say is move beyond the boundaries. Um, be willing to reimagine and reinvent 
And as Audre Lorde states, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. We've got to move outside of those boundaries to reimagine. And we are well placed to do that as people who are bilingual, bicultural, multilingual, multicultural. The last is um, to emphasize the notions of Freire around education as a practice of freedom. I want to leave you with these three images, the rose in the concrete, the beauty and the harshness of the concrete, compromesa with promise. And I want to leave you with a Mexican proverb, quisieron enterrarnos pero no sabían que éramos semillas. Translated, they wanted to bury us but they do not know that we are seeds. Our communities are seeds, black, brown, indigenous, and they cannot bury us. And we have all the potential in the world to continue this journey to humanization um, collectively toward our journey toward mutual humanization. And so as we move forward to the respondent and to questions, I also want to pose a question to you. Uh, what is your journey toward humanization? And how do you perceive a humanizing pedagogy? Thank you, I'm very grateful. Thank you, Professor Sadezov, for such a powerful presentation. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave the comments to our uh, respondent, Dr. Jackie Lick. Uh, Dr. Lick, you may proceed. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, Prof. Salazar. I just feel like I need to first sit with what you have done and not just launch into, uh, you know, um, my respondent. Uh, section, uh, I just feel like, can I just sit for a minute and just absorb that beautiful, um, pr profound, moving journey that you have just shared with us. Um, and so I will do that and try and share my screen at the same time, um, if that's okay. And I think this must also become one of the phrases of the year. Can you see my screen? Yes, so so thank you. Um, uh, Prof Salazar, it really is a singular honor for us to have listened to you today. You are playing, as Mukhtar says, a leading role in advancing a humanizing turn in, in your scholarship. And we really are grateful for the opportunity to engage in a, in a South to South conversation about bringing humanizing hope and reclamation and reappropriation. And we know that our colonial histories have played out very differently and that there are complexities about what constitutes North and, and South and whether it is just a geopolitical or a geographical perspective. But we have in common the oppression that indigenous peoples have shared um, without laying claim at the same time that there's a universalization of our experiences. So as I said, my name is Jackie Lick and, and my discipline is linguistics and language. And, and I would like to situate my, my 10 minute response uh, within the broader Nelson Mandela educational context and, and what is, has been our journey towards humanize, uh, a humanizing pedagogy. Um, Prof, so I will be sharing multiple stories um, in, in the 10 minutes, I will try. Um, and so I'd like to use the time to consider your call for a humanizing pedagogy um, in education and, and what it is that we need to be responsive to in our context and how we are taking up the school, as I've said. So um, my own journey, um, he has been very different to the, this, the journey of what our students are facing at the moment. Um, we have different, yeah, as I said, yeah, we have different journeys and my one was rooted in a time growing up under apartheid. As a person, you know, of mixed race, our humanities were being taken away from us by a larger system, but we had 
the activist teacher that you are. We had those teachers that helped us with the transformational resistance that, that, that you speak to. So uh, Prof Zinn is one of them. Uh, she, I'm not sure if she's uh, here with us today. So um, I'd like to start also with this um, quote from Kim Scott, who is an indigenous um, uh, Australian. Uh, his novel, That Dead Man Dance, he, he says, we learned your words and songs and stories and never knew that you didn't want to hear ours. Mm -hmm. And to me, that speaks a lot to what you have been saying um, today. So if, if I reference what's happening in, uh, in South Africa, we know that um, our stories of our students, if they have to tell their stories, they encounter a race, a class, a gendered um, education. They encounter either a resource rich or resource poor world. And, and what this, these worlds have in common is this dehumanizing Eurocentric perspective that is reproduced and sustained. And the only way we can take up this challenge is to speak to what you have been your work is to take it beyond the classroom walls, beyond the school gates, beyond the administrative, the curriculum pages, to the local production of knowledge like you are doing, that reflects a community and a society's knowledge needs and aspirations. So um, what you have, you, what you shared with us was really, as I said, very moving and, and our students are telling similar stories and I'd like to focus a little bit on the indigenous languages and the no that has been ripped from the bodies of our students. Um, so I'll just move my slide. And um, so, so the slide that I have up at the moment is comes from a module on language acqui acquisition that we teach at uh, our university. It was curriculated within a northern canon. And now we are trying to enhance African knowledge through the self-reflective dialogical spaces for our students. And, and we, we, we are getting our students to reflect on their and the community's members, literacy histories and practices. And this is what students have said when we present them with the Northern Canons. The one student said, I do not know how to answer when somebody asks, what is my mother tongue? Do I need to have one mother tongue? I do not understand. Do I have many interlanguages? If I speak more than one language, how do I acquire them if I have these separate systems? I have difficulties making sense of this reading. My mother said our house is now an English free zone. She realizes we are losing touch with our language. I am relearning my language. These are students who are now in their possibly fourth, fifth year of study. So they are the voices of students who have spent years being straight jacketed and white streamed to fit a system that silenced their language knowledges. They were forced to learn a standard form of indigenous languages that was invented and codified by colonists. And in this classroom, as I said, they're learning the Northern canon of language acquisition. And so they're journaling about these grapplings that are they finding so diffuse and alienating uh, that, that can be said to be stealing their humanities. But, but there is this fight for reclamation. They are troubling the illogical reasoning um, that characterizes our context. And I think so they are gaining your, what you talk about, the I power, the culture of power, the, pow the, the power of culture and the power of consciousness through this co-constructive pedagogy that we are engaged with. Um, more spaces for me that, that still need a humanizing lens um, at, are, are spaces that like our online spaces where in which where intersectionalities are not visible. So at the moment, um, the online space presents us with new ways of misrecognition. Prophet Tar spoke about that earlier in this week uh, on this webinar. The online space has become an English hegemonic space. You know, it's, it's focused on the technicists, the banking, retelling of knowledge. The main concerns are plagiarism and not induction into how student voices can emerge. And, and to me, that space needs to be uh, uh, is a dehumanizing space at the moment for our students. And, and then just moving on to the many dehumanizing narratives in South African education and the new ones that are circulating. We hear of suspended nutrition plans for school learners during a pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, a top up grant support grant is being stopped. The dire conditions under which the majority of our students learn. Um, 
as I said, the standard forms of indigenous languages that was invented by missionaries and imposed on our students, and the token attempts to incorporate indigenous languages in assessments now at schools without students being given access to these languages in their classrooms. So these include uh, theories of Bix and Kalp that come to us from the north where the approach is very test focused, not to focus on the sociocultural, a communicative teaching approach conceptualized within language acquisition, theories of stable fixed languages. These all misrecognize our multilingual realities. And we try to do research at schools to address the challenges that our learners have with, or students have with, with language. But we need to critique, are we continuing to do this within predominant language paradigms? Um, how can we enact a humanizing pedagogy from early childhood development right up to high education? And you've given us a whole lot of tools to do that. How do we um, get the reflective spaces for teachers and students to identify these gendered class race practices so that we can resignify our, uh, um, these naturalized practices and assumptions and become these humanizing self-critical agents? So I just want to end with uh, talking about what it is that we are doing at the Nelson Mandela in a little bit more detail. Um, on the screen there, I, I, um, I have um, the first point that I've already spoken to about these self-critical dialogical spaces we're creating in our classrooms. And I know um, Dr. Child spoke about this earlier. This is happening in the Faculty of Education a lot. Um, we are in our faculty, for example, dialoguing with local first peoples to research, excavate and teach with them varieties of a language uh, that was spoken um, in the Eastern Cape. Um, we are also have a language policy project that's led by Prof Mzanga, where we are engaging in a co-construction of a new lang a living language policy. Um, that's crafted from conversations about lived, ex uh, sorry, lived experiences, because the politics of recognition have excluded indigenous languages. And as uh, I'm not sure if you know, Prof Salazar, we have humanizing pedagogy as a philosophy at the university. Um, you know, it underpins, it's the center of everything that we do. So, but that does not say that they are, that, that they are not any dehumanizing practices that we need to attend to and that we need to co-craft uh, towards a more humanizing pedagogy with students, teachers, administrators, parents, and civil society. So that, um, and, and, and to continue to ask the questions that what, who are our students? How do they navigate our, our, our spaces? How um, are we engaging their voices? And what are they encountering? And, and we know there's no universal recipe, but we take um, we, we take from what you have saying, and I think that is something that we can take on board, even though, you know, um, as I said, there's no universal recipe and, and humanizing pedagogy is, is, a, is a social practice um, and it's an ideological practice. So I'd like to end with a, a, a poem that many people in the room may ha have seen already because it, it comes from our assessment um, dialogues and, and our curriculum dialogues. And it was a poem from the Faculty of Education, a student who said, what is this thing called curriculum? It is clearly, it is a being, a powerful being. It isn't victim nor predator. It lives not only in books, but libraries, not only in words, but minds. It is parasite, yet also a host. Mm -hmm. And she was referencing here yeah, the very Eurocentric curriculum we have. And, um, I've just taken the last line now and I'm going to end. She says, I'm so close to you. I have bleached your skin. I have twisted your tongue. I have become you. If you must question me, you need to be the answer. If you want me dead, you need to die. You need to shed. You need to sit in the sun and soak back the color I have drained from you. Are you prepared for that? And this was a student who, as I say, she was part of a process where we were engaging on, 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 making a more humanizing uh, curriculum frameworks. So Prof, I've just shared a few of the ways in which we are try you know, trying to speak to a humanizing pedagogy. There are many, many, many more ways, um, but I don't want to, to take from your beautiful story because I want that also just to sit with us, but I'm just very grateful for that we are able to enter into conversation with you. Uh, um, as I said, south to south 
uh, conversations. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. It's pretty amazing that your university is taking a university-wide approach to a humanizing pedagogy. That's incredibly unique, I would say, um, situates you in a very special spot. Um, and then to hear the alignment between South Africa and our experiences in the US is pretty phenomenal as well. As you're saying, there's no universal experience, but there are most definitely connections around language loss, right? Um, around skin color and the messages we get about phenotype and skin color, as well as culture, the loss of culture and, and wanting to reclaim our treasures. Thank you so much, Dr. Lick, uh, Prof. Salazar. Um, there is a question that was sent, and I'll, I'll, I'll begin with that question. Uh, Dr. Lick, please don't go away. You can remain on screen as well. Okay, uh, and yeah. <laughs> and of course, for those in the room, feel free to uh, raise your hand if you'd like to perhaps, you know, uh, pass a comment or post a question using your mic. Uh, Prof Salazar, the question is, is the term humanization an extract from the African philosophy of Ubuntu? If not, how are the two different or similar to one another? So tell me more about the African philosophy. Hence my uh, prompt to keep Dr. Lick on screen as well. <laughs> uh, I mean, we should we should ask um, maybe um, people in the room as well. But it's a it's a uh, the African philosophy of Ubuntu is what you're asking about, Mukhtar. Yes. Yeah. So so it is a collect. It, it comes from a collectivist, communitarian world view. Um, you know that that through, that the community is something is foregrounded and not the individualistic um, aspirations and needs and so that um, I am a person because of other persons you know mm. so so it, it, it takes a, that uh, what they call a cosmo vision um, outlook yes sorry I'm, not, I'm probably not doing a proper justice I must ask no, uh, put no can you on the spot and ask her to also explain. She this is, is so Prof. Nzanga is in the room as well. Uh, uh, for the oh, participants, I've, yeah. I've enabled. Uh, okay, so to... I can I can just add a few to to what Jackie has already alluded to, but then. Ahead, Prof. Okay, just a second. Um, I'm trying to sit up straight. <laughs> So basically, <laughs> so basically, um, Ubuntu is one of, of the values, you know, in the African context. In my language, you say, umdung, umdung abandu. you are because of, or just like Jackie has explained it, you are because of the others. So this approach actually draws attention to humanness, to togetherness you know, to interdependence, to communalism. And it is actually regarded as an inclusive practice. In other words, whatever you do, you always think of the other person first and you do things together. So that is what this value is, is actually based on. I yeah, think I, I will stop beautiful. there. It's so beautiful. And I definitely want to learn more about the concept. and. That really, I, I love presenting because I learn. I always learn when I present and I interact with people. And one thing I've always struggled with is to make as that uh, Freire is considered the father of a humanizing pedagogy. And I don't believe that is the case. And I refuse to give a white male credit for the concept, right? And so the question is, where did humanization arise from, right? But Freire may have put pedagogy on the humanization, but where did humanization arise from? I think it's beautiful to say it arose from Africa as humanity arose from Africa, right? And so I would say absolutely humanization is at the center and it's at the center of African philosophies. And that contrast of the statement, I think therefore I am versus we are therefore I am, 
right? And so I think that is the nexus of that humanization. And, and actually, I'm going to include that in my writing now, that the humanization, the nexus comes from Africa and the center comes from Africa. And, and humanization comes from that as humanity comes from Africa as well. So I think it's beautiful. And I would say yes to the question, yes. And how important it is to, to go back and look at humanization and the roots of humanization and not to give Europe credit for that, by the way, because um, again, the winner gets to take credit for everything, right? And so um, the, the winner gets to write our history and our philosophies and our theories. And so um, in this case, we are all winners. And I believe that it's important to center humanization in indigenous communities um, and communities who have typically been marginalized. So I thank you for teaching me. Uh, what a phenomenal thing to learn. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, I'm inviting Prof uh, Pele to um, unmute and, and speak. I see the hand is raised. Thank you, Mukta. Um, thank you, Prof, for a, for a really interesting and engaging um, presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think I would like to, to just um, engage a little bit on the I power. Because I think that is that that is really very important, and the way one interprets that I power uh, is is really you know makes a huge is very significant for humanizing pedagogy. So I would like to know what your th thoughts are on a liberal framework that focuses on the I and the poor little child instead of a more social ontology with a focus on critical consciousness. Yeah, the I power for me came from a gap I saw in the literature around culturally responsive teaching and a humanizing pedagogy. And when I often thought back to, well, how people often ask me, how are you successful? How are you different? I'm the only person in my family who went to college out of seven um, and very distinct in my community in terms of what I saw the people around me doing or what I was able to attain. What my often answer is often, I learned to believe in myself. I learned to stop waiting for others to believe in me. And I learned to have that, that confidence and that belief in myself. And so that really arose from my own stories and my own experience. But there's a danger there as well I want to share with you around um, in the US with my experience with white teachers is they really connect with this idea of eye power because it connects with the idea of individuality, right? And in the US, that's something that's very much valued, individuality. And so teachers will say things like, um, I, I love my students, I value them as individuals. But what I stress is that if you don't see our culture and you don't see who we are fully in our full development, then you aren't able to grasp who we are. And so, there is that positive of making sure that we stress individuality and that I in the system, but not to make it the sole focus, that the I is surrounded by the whole, the I is surrounded by the community. And that's why I defined I power as individual and collective. So it's never just the individual, it's the individual and the intersectionality of their identities. And that's something I believe is novel in terms of the theory around humanizing pedagogy or culturally responsive teaching. But I think it's important that we not lose sense of the I, but understand that the I is surrounded by the community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Prof, there's a, there's a comment in the chat box. I, I, I don't know if I should read it. Um, have, have you read it? Um, okay, if I'll... you'd like to read it, that'd be great. Or if the person who posted oh, it. Like... Yeah, perhaps, uh, Amina Sal, if I could invite you to read your comment, um, that would be more just, I think. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mukhtar, for having me read my comment and relive the moment. <laughs> but yeah, um, Prof Salazar, I'd just like to thank you for a very profound presentation. Um, your humanizing pedagogy is reflected in the sincerity and the humility of your stories, and the fact that you have stated that the no probrecito syndrome will exist in your teaching philosophy. 
These symptoms make us stronger as individuals. And I would just like to reflect on one such story because um, I do believe that Mukhtar has said that we can um, reflect on some of our stories if they are familiar with yours. Um, I was in grade eight in what is regarded as a historically disadvantaged school. And um, a teacher called us dumb duck colors and that we were going nowhere in life. And at that moment, I did not realize how those words would resonate with me in future. And for years, I simply just, I just forgot about it. Um, and then recently I saw her at a conference and then just suddenly those words came back to me in a flash. And I was almost um, stunned to see her, but I also wanted to go to her and, and tell her, here I am, it's almost 30 years later. And I introduced myself to her and I felt proud of whom I ha have become. And that I so much wanted to tell her in my introduction, oh, I am the dumb duck colored girl in your grade eight class of 1988, do you remember me? But I think I was just um, that moment. So it was then that I realized the importance of being humane in your teaching practices and being careful of what you say to your students, because you, inevitably you are, you, you, you do play in, an integral role in shaping somebody's future. I mean, I, that comment that you made could have damaged um, somebody else completely. And, you know, but yeah, but thank you very much once again for a very, very informative and um, profound, um, heart-wrenching uh, presentation. Thank you, Amina, thank for you. sharing your story. It's so powerful and, and very much like my story as well. Um, I hope you get a chance to read the blog. In the blog, I actually give examples of how teachers can steal your humanity by never saying anything at all. They can do it through their curriculum, instruction, assessment, and learning community. And so, yeah, the words are powerful, but the deeds and the actions are also very powerful. And, and educators send us a clear message about our humanity through their practice as well. But thank you again for sharing your story, and I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much, uh, Amina, and thank you, Prof, for the response. Um, colleagues, we are reaching the end of the session. I could possibly allow one more question or one more comment. If anyone would like to, you are welcome to unmute yourself. Going once. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Prof, I'm going to ask Dr. Lick if she has any closing remarks and then we'll move to you for closing remarks. Mukhtar, no, I, I, I don't think so. I, as I said to you, I just wanted to rest with, with me um, what Prof Salazar has said. I don't want to take anything from her presentation, which has been really amazing and which resonates with so many of our experiences in South Africa. And, um, and we're just grateful for the hope that her work gives us. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Dr. You Dr. All. As well. Well, yeah, I want to thank you all for the opportunity. It really has been an amazing opportunity to learn from you as well. Um, and I hope to continue to do that in the future. I just want to tell you I'm with you on your journey toward humanization and you're with me. And there's so much to accomplish and so much to do, right? But um, together, I feel that we can most definitely accomplish this and, and bring humanization to a university and to a nation and to our globe. So thank you so much for all of your work and your efforts um, to all of the professors as well, but for all of you on the call. Uh, Prof, there's a question that came in very quickly. If you if you could respond, you know, I think they, uh, they know that this might be, you know, uh, <laughs> the last few minutes uh, to engage with you. Um, Prof, the person would like to know what your views are concerning humanization through online learning, particularly with reference to our current realities? Uh, what are yeah. the opportunities? I think that's a great question. And I know your first webinar addressed that as well. Um, I do think it's harder to connect uh, online learning and students are struggling. We're seeing the data nationwide in the United States 
as students are struggling with online learning, but I do see an opportunity there that we can see into each other's homes. And so I take that opportunity often, and that's where I have my students share their home life, right? Their children, their hobbies, their pet, what's in their background, I ask questions about it to connect. And so I also bring in community members a lot to team teach with me. I do that in our teacher ed courses. I always have a community member now teaching with me online. So they get a live um, teacher or educator to interact with and, and it's always an educator of color. And so that's something they may not have the opportunity in, in our predominantly white institution to interact with. So I do think there are opportunities and there are many lessons that we can take um, in terms of humanizing this online space and taking every chance we can get to connect with one another, whatever it is. So I would say there's definitely challenges, but oh yes, there's opportunities and, and we need to take advantage of those and keep them with us when this online learning shifts um, and we're back face to face. I definitely wanna keep a lot of the same uh, practices that I've learned around having a community member in my classroom, for example, or reaching out to communities through technology. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, Prof, uh, our time is up. Thank you to the participants for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Leek, for your response. And Prof Salazar, thank you so much. Um, in fact, when you replied to our invitation, the entire team got so excited that it was positive. Um, so again, you know, we, we are very grateful that you made the time to join us, especially seeing that it is so early in the States at the moment. Uh, thank you, Prof, uh, for your presentation. And we hope to continue uh, walking this journey together towards humanization. Thank you to everyone for joining us. And I do encourage you to join us in our third webinar next week that will be addressing the humanizing pedagogy uh, in the online teaching and learning spaces. Thank you so much, colleagues. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mukhtar.